page because I wrote it today and it's actually <laughs> quite, oh, okay, maybe I'm not, quite pertinent. So it's been set up to undertake cutting edge computational creativity research, which I'll describe very briefly in a second, um, and bridge the gap between computational creativity theory and practice. Um, actually, I'm regretting saying I'm going to read all this out now because it's, uh, you can read it on the web pages later. Um, but essentially, we, um, we're an AI group aiming to um, commercialize this notion that um, software can be creative, independent of people, um, and alongside people. Uh, and with a particular emphasis on digital games. Um, we believe that games are the you know, most important and interesting art form of the 21st century, although other academics at Falmouth might not agree with us. Um, and really that um, building games is a creative activity that everybody should be able to do. Right now it's very easy for children, for example, to write a very bad story and get better at writing a story. You just need a pen and a paper. It's very easy for children to um, paint a picture or even to play a piece on a piano. It's very difficult for children to write a bad game and learn to be better at um, producing games. So we are interested in democratizing game design so that everybody can um, produce a game. And live in front of your eyes, we will generate a new game on an iPod. Um, <coughs> so let's get back to the slide. Um, yes, yeah, so computational creativity is essentially handing over creative responsibility to software in arts and science projects. Um, so wherever you think, how am I creatively contributing to this project, and how can I get the software to do that instead of me? Then if you think in that way, then you're a computational creativity researcher. Um, and yeah, we want to be a sustainable research institute. We're sick of having to beg the government and the European Commission and various other places for money every three or four years. Um, and really, we're lucky in our field because the software that we write to do our research with is commercializable, and we're fairly sure of that. Um, whereas other computer scientists, their software is, is really for demonstration only, not likely to ever find its way into an app store. Um, so, yeah, we're also um, trying to, to sell the platforms later on. I wanted to show you this, and um, we do a, a fair amount of outreach, um, and the new scientists are very keen on computational creativity, and they've covered it a number of times. This was on the 29th of August, this piece they interviewed me. Um, and the reason I'm mentioning it here is um, it's called The Art of Programming. Um, the challenge is to teach them to code, says AI researcher and me. Um, and uh, where's the line? Yeah, I think we'll only see computers making true discoveries when software can program itself. So this is uh, one particular take on, on computational creativity that I'm trying to push within the community. Um, and we've had a number of projects um, uh, ongoing um, where we attempt to get software to be a programmer, which is not as easy as you might think. The intuitive you think the software will be better at programming than painting, for example, or better at programming than um, composing music, but that's not the case. Um, programming is a very difficult creative activity, um, and uh, just because software is a program itself doesn't mean to say it's very good at programming. Um, so that's one of our takes um, on, on computational creativity, which might be of interest to uh, a software group like yourself. Um, two of our current projects. Um, we are allowed to fail big um, because we're underwritten by this research grant. So Phil mentioned it, it's a 2.4 million euro research grant that is paying for Ed and, and myself to be here. And that's um, the tip of the iceberg. I'm involved in eight projects uh, of, of, kind of that kind of stand, that kind of um, size, uh, ranging from half a million up to eight million, as you see at the end. Um, so we can attempt to change the world of games um, without worrying about our salaries, at least for a few years. Um, so the fail bit for the first um, software we've been writing in the group, Techie Techie Tech, tech, tech um, is automatic puzzle generation where the puzzles can't be solved, which is breaking all the rules of good design um, for games, obviously. Um, but there are so many activities out there which are futile, which people still engage in. I'm a reformed mathematician, and I spent years trying to prove things which weren't provable, um, which turned out to be false, for example. Can we turn that into a plus? Um, can we um, get people to say, you know, I enjoyed two hours trying to solve a game which wasn't solvable. Because um, they may well have solved it. We don't know. The, the beauty of this is these games are automatically generated. So we don't know, as designers, whether they will actually um, be solvable or not. And so you'll be the first person in the world to solve that, um, that game, just like you'd be the first person in the world to solve a math problem if you, if you were in that area. So we might be able to turn that into a plus, um, and that's where we're going to <coughs> The big project that um, Ed and I have been working on um, you know, every hour of every day for the last three or four months is called Scylla, um, and it's for producing digital fascinators. So you know millinery fascinators, they're these kind of 
hat accessories which are meant to attract your attention but not for about more than 10 seconds. Well, fascinated by kind of mini games, art animations, interactive artworks, um, and digital fascinators are, are the ones on things like iPhone. Um, the way we're going to fail big with this um, is to, we've got a casual creator where you can um, swipe and build a game, um, as I'm doing here, in just a few seconds. Um, and you can literally, with the four presses of the thumb, you can have a brand new digital game in your hand. Um, and the next stage for this will be a secondary system which comes on board and says, what the hell are you doing? You know, I'm sick of games that you've got red dots that you have to chase around. Um, why don't you play, why don't you design a game like this? The software will wrestle control of the casual creator from your hands um, and build games for you. Obviously that could be Microsoft Clippy gone mad and be the world's worst and most annoying thing ever. Or it could, if done correctly, um, be something wonderful and you, you watch the software create for you and you help uh, it and it guides you. Um, and that could be a, you know, a wonderful thing. So I just wanted to show you this software in simulation because uh, we'd like to hand out copies of it. Um, can you see that? Yeah, I'll just very quickly generate a new game. Um, so the design interface is very bad on the simulator. Uh, you can, the, the simplest way is just to choose an image. Uh, can I find a decent one? Let's see if that one. Yeah, sorry. I'm obviously hand picking this. This one might be good. Um, so that is now generating that image um, because it's just stored as a, as a genome of a few numbers. Um, and this is a game where you have to chase the dots around. Um, that animation of the dots isn't very good, so I'll change it just by clicking. Can you see them pulsating now? Oh, this is still not very good. Try a few more iterations. Never give demo some talk. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, so you can see that the uh, animation there is okay. Um, and now I'm just going to change. I'm going to put in. I could change the image and the lighting. I could turn on a spotlight, for example. Um, I could, but what I'm going to concentrate on is, and I can have a very fine grain control over how those particles move around. Um, but what I want to do is add a little bit of interaction. So I'm going to tag the shapes by dragging over them. I'm going to make them disappear. Uh, I'm going to have a 69 second countdown for no good reason. Um, the game will end when I've managed to tag them all. Um, and uh, the score will be how much time I've got left. When I press play, um, I've got 67 seconds to drag my finger, which is a lot better on the iPhone, um, over all of these um, pieces. And that's how easy we wanted to make it for people to, to play games, uh, to generate games. That's a brand new game which is just coming into existence. And it's thrilling when you do it um, on, on the iPhone. Um, and yes, from a context creativity perspective, um, will people, if software go, does what I've just done, if I purport myself as being creative by having created a game right there, um, will you accept software as being creative if it comes along and does the same? Um, and that's the big research question we're asking. Um, but the beauty of this is that we've got ourselves a software platform which could be marketed. Um, and we're going to get this on the App Store by the end of the year if it kills it. Um, and it probably will. Um, <laughs> so over to you, Ed, to talk about some... Um, um, so, yeah. so I'm involved in the research that Simon has just talked about, but I'm also um, a lecturer in the Games Academy here at the university. So I'd like to take a little bit of time to tell you about a couple of the courses that we have. Um, so the Games Academy is one of the newest departments in the university. It's only been around for just over a year now. And we've got um, seven teaching staff and 100 plus students. And we have two um, undergraduate degree courses that we offer. Um, so BA Digital Games, um, the first cohort of students have just entered into their second year on that course. Um, this is obviously a game development course. It's based around a studio model. So the, the students from practically day one of the course, we put them together into teams that essentially emulate small indie game development startups. So there's a huge emphasis on agile methodology. I mean, we're not just teaching the students kind of here is the agile process from a textbook. They're actually living it um, practically from the first weeks of the course. Um, 
There are six routes through the course. Um, some of them you might expect, so art, animation, audio, uh, game design, programming, and writing in the sense of uh, narrative and dialogue and that kind of thing. Um, so the, the students have their own disciplines within their teams and they come together and with their varying skills that we teach them, um, they create games which hopefully by the end of the course are products that they could um, put out there on the market and would stand alongside um, the kind of indie games that, that you see for sale. Um, so the emphasis uh, with the programming students, they're taught C Sharp. All of the students use uh, the Unity game development framework because that's very popular among small indie teams. Um, yeah, so as I say, that course has been running for just over a year and uh, there are already a couple of teams there that are producing some quite exciting games. Um, so we're really looking forward to seeing how that progresses. Um, the other course we offer, um, this course is only a few months old, it only started this academic year, um, is the BSC Computing for Games. So this is uh, taught by myself and Michael Scott. Um, I will point out, this is the first Bachelor of Science degree that Falmouth University has offered. Uh, Falmouth, of course, number one arts university. Um, so this is our first foray into uh, the sciences. Um, so the content is a lot more technical than on the BA. Um, obviously, we're still Falmouth, you know, we're not Cambridge, so we're not, uh, mm -hmm. we're not kind of going into real hardcore computer science. <coughs> um, so we still have that creative edge to the course. Um, but for example, we teach C++, um, SDL, OpenGL, and the kind of the nitty gritty of what goes into making a game engine and what goes into creating high performance software products. Um, so we're hoping that our students will leave the course with a, a deep understanding of computer science and software engineering. So not just the, the theory that you might get from a traditional computer science course, but also the more practical software engineering stuff that is already in place in the BA course. Um, so again, there is an emphasis on agile methodology. So um, as we'll see in a couple of slides time, um, the students do large scale uh, group projects and they use the agile process for those projects. Okay, so here's a quick outline of what we teach on the course. Uh, so we are, for reasons I don't quite understand, the first year is level four, um, but we're here now. So throughout the year we have principles of computing, which is essentially an introduction to programming for the <coughs> students who haven't done any programming before. Uh, we also cover a little bit of theoretical computer science in there. Um, and we also cover um, a little bit of stuff on kind of formal um, software development practices, although that's covered more in other modules. Um, we have a strand uh, on creative computing, um, which I just realized now actually there may be a lot of overlap between what James and Al are doing, so we should definitely talk about that. Um, so in the first semester, um, we focus on using Python to manipulate images, sounds, video in creative ways. Um, so again, not just seeing software engineering as this technical discipline, but injecting a bit of creativity into it and encouraging the students to play with code in the same way that, say, the art students might be playing with paint on a canvas. Um, in the second term, we continue with the creative computing theme um, but we look more into things like um, creating mashups using web APIs and um, creating novel hardware interfaces for games using Arduino. Um, we also have another strand, game platform studies and game development practices, where we look a bit more into... Um, so these are the, the modules really where we cover the agile process in a lot more detail, um, and also a bit more detail on what goes into making a game and what goes into making a game engine. Um, so by the end of semester one, the students will have created a simple mobile game using the Kiwi framework in Python. And by the end of the first year, they will have produced uh, a desktop game, albeit a, quite a simple one, um, using C++ with SDL. Uh, so looking ahead to the second year, um, we focus a little bit more on some of the 
um, more specialised disciplines within game development, so um, artificial reality and virtual reality, um, sorry, augmented reality and virtual reality, um, so stuff like Oculus and all that kind of stuff that's uh, going to be the next big thing in the games industry, if you believe those people. Um, graphics, obviously high performance 3D graphics and that kind of thing. Artificial intelligence and uh, distributed systems, so things like um, multi-threaded programming and uh, network programming. Um, a third of the second year is taken up with two projects. So a large individual project um, where we're hoping to get the students to do something akin to a research project um, or to create a, a fairly large um, game. Um, <coughs> a collaborative project where the students will work with the students on the BA course. Um, so as I mentioned before, the BA course has programmers, but they don't go into quite as much technical detail. So we're hoping that our students will essentially act as consultants for those teams. So they can kind of be shipped into those teams and solve maybe some of the more difficult technical challenges um, that they're having. Uh, third year, um, we look at professional software engineering, so really drilling into the students, the whole agile methodology and, um, and that kind of thing, and efficiency and optimization, so getting them to the stage where they can create real high performance uh, code for games. And then two thirds of the third year is taken up with another individual project and another collaborative project, which again follow a similar model to the ones I discussed here, but are uh, obviously much more in depth. Um, so just briefly what we're trying to achieve with this course. Um, so these are the, the learning outcomes which guide everything that we do. Uh, so we want to create graduates who are well versed in uh, technical development practices. So agile obviously is the, the key word, um, the buzzword that we're all using today. Um, but that's something that we're really keen on, on drilling into them. And communication skills obviously so that they can work in teams. Um, critical, critical evaluation so that they can be critical about their own work, both from a technical and a creative uh, perspective. Um, research so that, um, this is quite unusual for an undergraduate degree, but we do want the students to be kind of pushing forward the, the frontier of knowledge. Um, myself and Mike are both active researchers, so we really want to bring that into the, the courses that we teach. Um, enterprise, we want them to be producing products that could conceivably come to market um, and professional, of course, um, I think that's just the thing about getting them to actually turn up to lectures, which uh, sometimes is a challenge. Um, so yeah, that's a summary of um, the BSc course and um, some of my colleagues could talk a similar length about the BA course. Um, before I hand back to Simon, I will just point out we are looking to expand our portfolio of courses um, in the Games Academy. So if any of you have any ideas of the type of skills that uh, you think we should be training our undergraduates in, then please do have a chat to myself or Mike and we'd be very happy to have your feedback. Okay, thanks. Okay, one final slide, um, because um, Phil mentioned this in his talk and then skipped over it and I realised I wasn't covering this kind of thing. Um, yeah, uh, we, we're, we're quite well funded. We've just um, had announced this year a big new project, which is mostly run by York. Um, Falmouth is a spoke of it, as are Goldsmiths in London and the Cass Business School in London. This is a digital creativity hub. It's an EPSRC Next Step digital economy hub, where the idea is to take um, the research which has come from the, in our case, um, perhaps £50 million pounds worth of research which has been given to our consortium over the last um, five to ten years, and turn it into real value for creative industry companies uh, in the UK. Um, and so it's a £4 million pound grant which will hire a lot of researchers, um, including one who's coming to Falmouth. Um, it's a five-year um, research project for him. Um, and uh, with another four or so million pledged by the 80-plus industry partners that we've got, uh, but that isn't, it's not a close shot by any um, stretch, so we're always looking for more. So um, both Ed and I will be coming to you guys and asking about um, the commercial side. Um, if you're interested in the R&D side, then please come to us. And if you think your software could be more creative in and of itself, um, then please let um, Ed and I bend your ear and we'll try and you know, um, you know, talk to you religiously about how software could be a lot more than it is um, right now. So we'd like to take software to the next level. Okay, thanks a lot.
Does that include local companies and industry partners in terms of? Yes, I mean um, the 